Well, today as we wrap up this series, we're going to talk about the subject, Crafting Your Child's Character. Crafting your child's character. We as parents have a tremendous responsibility to try as best as we can to craft the character of our children. But before I get too far into this message this morning, I want to say, I think that when children make wise decisions, we as parents take too much credit for it. And that when children make poor decisions, we take too much blame. And what I mean by that is that Regardless of what we do as parents, not that it's unimportant, it is very important, but there comes a point in time in every child's life where they make their own decisions. And when that happens, if those decisions are great, we celebrate with them. If those decisions maybe aren't so great, it's too easy for us to beat up on ourselves and try to second guess, well, did I do everything that I could have done? Because the bottom line is every person has their own responsibility for themselves before the Lord. And so I just want to say that if you're at a place in your life where you're questioning some of the decisions that your kids are making, be careful not to take on too much of the blame because, again, they have their own uh, responsibility before the Lord. And then on the other hand, if your kids are making great decisions, don't break your arm pat yourself on the back either. We want to take seriously this job of parenting, but we also want to recognize that we are to turn our kids over to the Lord, even as the Barnetts did this morning, and recognize that they are in God's hands. Amen? Well, a couple of scriptures that I want to investigate this morning as we consider the importance of crafting our child's character. The first is in Proverbs 22 and 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. And then Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol, or from the grave. And so this morning, as we consider this important subject of crafting your child's character, we're going to begin by considering the mandate of discipline. The mandate of discipline. One day there was a mother who was preparing a special dinner. She had guests that were coming over that night for a dinner party, and so she'd already cleaned the house, and now she was in the kitchen, and she was working feverishly, trying to put together this special meal. She'd never cooked this dish before, and of course you know all the pressure that was there. And Her little son just kept running in and out of the kitchen and tearing through the house, and he was just at his mother's side pestering her nonstop, and he kept ignoring her threats and kept ignoring her warnings. Finally, he accidentally knocked the dish onto the floor. Mother wheeled around, grabbed a broom, and took off after him. And he took off faster than she could get to him and crawled up underneath the house. And she realized that she couldn't mess with him anymore. She had to get back in and try to salvage dinner. So she said, well, you just wait till your dad gets home. So she went inside and she, you know, fixed what he had broken and uh, got back, started on dinner, trying to get everything ready for the evening. A little while later, her husband came in from work and she explained to him what had happened and told him where he might go find the boy. She said, go discipline your son. So he headed out and he grabbed a flashlight and started looking up underneath the house and he crawled up underneath there and he was up there about five minutes and finally a little head poked around one of the supporting stanchions and a little voice said, Dad, is she after you too? <laughs> <laughs> Parents have got a tremendous responsibility to discipline their children and when they do, they are reflecting God. Because we know from the writer of Hebrews that God disciplines us. He disciplines his kids. And God expects parents to discipline their children as well. And godly discipline results in positive benefits. Hebrews 12, verses 10 through 11, we looked at last week. It says, God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And so there are benefits that come from godly discipline. And it's important to add that adjective, uh, godly discipline, because not all discipline is godly. 
and the scriptures never give us the right to, you know, abuse our children or to, to deal with them in a harsh manner. We are to discipline them, but it is to be a godly and loving discipline. And that kind of discipline brings a harvest of good. It brings a harvest of holiness. It brings a harvest of peace and of righteousness, the Bible says. So proper parental discipline has positive benefits. It drives away folly or foolishness, the Proverbs says. In other words, it'll help your kids from acting stupidly or rashly, if for no other reason they're afraid of your discipline. It may save them even from an early grave because of decisions made in an undisciplined life. So proper discipline is healthy, it's good, it's godly, it's loving. Scripture never advocates child abuse, but proper discipline motivated by love and not anger is the type of discipline that will bring positive results in the life of a child. In Ephesians 6.4, we're told, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I remember as a child, I got a lot of discipline. I earned a lot of discipline. I was pretty energetic. <laughs> But I never once wondered whether or not my parents loved me, ever. And whenever I would be disciplined, then they would hug me, and then they would say something like, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. And I was like, well, then let me give you the spanking. <laughs> they never went for that, though. You know, I just <laughs> but the point was, there was love. And there was a sense that I had, even as a child, that my parents loved me. And they are correcting me because they love me and because they know uh, I, I can't, you know, usurp their authority. Of course, I didn't think of the word usurp, but you know what I mean. I, I knew that the discipline that they brought into my life was discipline because they loved me. I certainly wasn't neglected. And uh, I remember this one time when my sister and I were just at each other's throats. I mean, just yeah, 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 back and forth. And my poor mother, I don't know how many times she'd already <laughs> disciplined us that day, but she was standing at the kitchen sink when she broke down in tears. Why, God? <laughs> and me and my sister just looked at each other like, I think we pushed her over the edge this time. <laughs> but mom and dad were actively involved in our lives. And that uh, activity, you know, it included the, the warm, fuzzy stuff. It included reading to us bedtime stories. It included taking us out and spending time together as a family. But it also included discipline because they loved us. And there was never any question of their love for us. You know, parents that don't understand that and, the, and then neglect discipline will find disastrous results come into the lives of their children and come into the lives of their family. And scripture is filled with examples of, of parents that were poor at parenting. King David, man after God's own heart. There were a number of things that David did that were right and that were righteous. But David was a lousy parent. Horrible. Probably one of the greatest examples of how not to raise your kids. He had a, a, a horrifically dysfunctional family and he exercised poor parenting skills. He was too lenient and too, uh, allowed his children to become self-indulgent. Adonijah was one of his sons. He was the fourth, fourth son born to David. After the death of the first three sons, Adonijah presumed that he was next in line for the throne. And so the Bible says that he prepared chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And he convinced Joab, the great general of David, to support him. He also convinced Abiathar, the priest, to support him as he held himself up to be king. And so they gathered together and they sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened calf. They held a feast to celebrate his coronation. They invited the royal officials and all of the other princes, save one, Solomon. He was not invited. Nor did they invite Benaiah, the priest, Nathan, uh, Benaiah, the uh, 
head bodyguard, Nathan the prophet, or Solomon. And Nathan told Bathsheba of what was happening. He instructed her to bring news to David and then to ask about Solomon. Go in there and ask, ask David if he's still going to make good on his pledge that Solomon will follow him on the throne. Well, as she was speaking to David, Nathan came in and corroborated the story. David immediately set up Solomon as co-regent. And then Adonijah was placed under house arrest. And due to other circumstances that are beyond the purvey of today's message, he would eventually be executed. Joab was also executed. More grief and bloodshed was introduced to the house of David. Adonijah's rebellion was caused because of David's poor parenting skills. He was indulgent and lenient. 1 Kings 1 and 6 says this of it. His father had spoiled him rotten as a child, never once reprimanding him. Why? I don't know. Perhaps it was because of the guilt David felt over his trespass when he became involved in an adulterous affair with Bathsheba and then worked things out for Bathsheba's husband Uriah to be killed on the battlefield. And perhaps it was because he was so riddled with guilt that he did not discipline his son. I don't know. We don't know why, but we do know that he didn't. He was neglectful, allowed Adonijah to become spoiled rotten, as the Message Bible puts it. And then there's another example of a, of a parent who was very lenient on his children and didn't practice discipline. His name was Eli. He was the high priest and the grandson of Aaron. He judged Israel for 40 years. The important thing for us to recall here is that Eli had been a righteous man. He was the high priest. He had righteously judged Israel for 40 years. And so it's, it's not that we look at these people and we say that they were horrible, rotten, no good people that didn't do anything right. But when it came to the importance of parenting and the responsibility of parenting, Eli, like David, dropped the ball. Eli's two sons assisted at the temple. They were wicked sons. The Bible says that they slept with the women who were serving at the temple. That they treated the offerings of God with contempt. The priests, you see, were fed by the sacrifices and that there were certain portions that were to be given to the priest. The fat of the offering was to be burned before the Lord as a savoring offering before God. And then these certain portions were to be given to the priests. But not with Eli's sons. The Bible says that they were taking more than was their portion. And that while the meat was still boiling in the cauldron, they would take the three-pronged fork and just plunge it in and take whatever they wanted. Before anything was offered to God, before the sacrifice was shared with the person who was bringing it. And that if the people refused, they would warn them and say, we will take it by force. I mean, they were wicked, wicked men. And their wicked behavior provoked the wrath of God. And so an unnamed prophet came and pronounced judgment upon Eli's house. Eli's sons would die on the same day. And premature death of men among Eli's descendants would continue generation after generation. That God would strike down the young men and take their lives from them prematurely. Why? Because in that system... To live to old age was to be put in a position of eldership. And Eli had so miscarried his position of authority that God was going to ensure that the house of Eli would fall and that there would never be elders again. They would lose their power and they would lose their influence in Israel. The fall of Eli's house was due to Eli's failure to discipline his sons. He knew of their sin, but he failed to restrain them. He rebuked them, and that was it. But as high priest, he had the authority to put them out of the temple, to literally take away their position where they were offending God. And so the sin of Eli was that he honored his kids more than he honored the Lord. Israel engaged the Philistines in battle, and Israel was defeated, losing 4,000 soldiers. Well, the elders sent for the Ark of the Covenant. The next day in battle, Israel was defeated. Even with the Ark of the Covenant, 30,000 Israeli soldiers were killed. 
The ark was captured, and Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. When the report came to Eli, the Bible says that he fell backward off his seat, breaking his neck and dying as well. Listen again to the words of the Proverbs. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol, from the grave. Parents have a divine mandate to discipline their children. They ignore that mandate to the peril of their family. So may we recognize this is our responsibilities. Parenting is tough. Parenting is hard. There will, there will be times when you feel like, I don't want to discipline my kid. I mean, it's been such a nice day. The last thing that I want to do now is to discipline my kid. You know what I'm talking about. But it's a responsibility that is relentless. And we are to discipline our kids, even as God disciplines us. Proverbs 13 and 24 tells us, A refusal to correct is a refusal to love. Love your children by disciplining them. And this brings us to the motive of discipline. You see, some people discipline their children in anger. They're angry, and so they discipline their kids in anger. Life's busy, responsibilities are, bur are uh, burdensome. The parent comes to the breaking point, and they lash out at the child. And friends, if you've ever done that, you need to repent before the Lord, and you need to ask your kid for forgiveness. Because that's not godly discipline. That's just, I'm mad, so I'm going to take it out on you. And sometimes that's physical, and sometimes that's verbal. But whenever it is, it's wrong. We as parents are to model discipline that is loving correction. Aren't you glad that God doesn't discipline us in his anger? <laughs> I know I am. When he disciplines me, it's out of his love for me. God's never out of control. God never flies off the handle in a rage. Even when Jesus drove the money changers from the temple of God, he took the time to fashion a whip. And I can just imagine that he was probably teaching them as he fashioned that whip. And they're probably like, I wonder what he's doing. It's not like he just looked for something, grabbed it, and then, you know, flew off the handle. He was in total control of what he was doing. I know he was in total control because he had the power to snuff them out. And he didn't. He simply drove them from the temple, giving them an opportunity to repent and to learn from their mistakes. Disciplining their children in anger and frustration leads some parents to abusive behavior. And that should never be true of the Christian home. That when we discipline our kids, it's out of love for them and out of genuine concern for their well-being, knowing that we've got a responsibility to raise them in such a way that they'll, they'll become responsible adults themselves someday. Sometimes it's hard to have the right motive when you're disciplining your kids. Reminds me of the mother who put her little boy to bed for the umpteenth time. I mean, she had one nerve left and he was jumping up and down on it. She gets him to bed and she looks at him and she says, If you call mama one more time, I'm going to spank you. And then she goes into the other room and she sits down. She no sooner sits down, she hears this timid voice from the other room. Mrs. Smith, can I have a glass of water? <laughs> How many of you know sometimes it's tough to withhold discipline <laughs> or to discipline in a way that is warm and loving? <laughs> but it's important for us to recognize that as Christian parents, we really don't have any other choice. We must discipline in a way that is patient and loving and long-suffering. But discipline, we must. Proverbs 3 and 12 tells us, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. And so what the scripture's telling us is that if God disciplines us, that's one of the ways we know I must be his child because he's disciplining me. Woe be to the person that never experiences the discipline of God because that person is not a child of God. I would much rather be disciplined by the Lord knowing that he loves me and that it's proof of my adoption. Proper discipline makes the child wise, Proverbs 19 and 15 tells us. Proper discipline teaches the child respect for authority, Hebrews 12 and 9.
Proper discipline produces the fruit of righteousness, Hebrews 12, 11. And this is the harvest of proper discipline. Parents who love their children desire to see that harvest in their child's life. And that's why they discipline. Not for any other reason, but because they love their kids and they want their kids to experience wisdom, respect for authority, righteousness. This harvest that comes as a result of discipline. So what are the means of discipline then? Well, the first is training. Training. Proverbs 22 and 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. American humorist Josh Billings once said, Train up a child in the way he should go, and walk there yourself once in a while. <laughs> I like what he's saying. We teach by our behavior as much as by our words, don't we? Perhaps we teach even more by our behavior than by our words. But we are to train our children in the ways of the Lord. There's a couple of categories of godly training we should consider. Mark 12, 30 and 31 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so this is Jesus answering the question, what are the greatest commandments? And he sums it up by saying, love God and love others. Those are the two biggest. And what you'll find that if you will truly follow those two commandments, you've fulfilled all the other ones in the meantime. Because if you love someone, you're not going to kill them. If you love someone, you're not going to you know, lie to them. If you love someone, you're not going to covet their possessions. If you love God, you're not going to put any other God before him, and on and on. Jesus says that if you'll fulfill these two commandments, you'll be fu fulfilling the law and the prophets by doing that. And so the first area that we are to teach our kids or train our kids is to love God. The love of God. And he says... To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So what does it mean? Well, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, that is a steadfast devotedness. It's speaking of being true-hearted, that you love God with a heart that is undivided, sincerely loving God, serving God with pure motives, serving God with a genuine love. That the Christian faith isn't, isn't so much a religious thing as it is a relationship thing. That you really love the Lord your God with a heart that is undivided. And as much as you're able to, you, you're loving Him with motives that are pure. You know, it's, it's not that I go to church because I'm afraid of dying without knowing the Lord. It's that I go to church because I love God. I serve the Lord because I love Him. I've been adopted into his family, and now I can't help but serve him. He has loved me first, and so now I love him as well. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, Jesus says. And then he says, and love him with all of your soul. How many of you have ever attended a dead church? You know, you go to a dead church and the, the music's kind of monotone and just kind of drones on and on and all the prayers are just kind of by rote and maybe they even say the Lord's Prayer but it's with no feeling, no emotion, no passion. The church is just kind of dead. You ever been to a church like that? Ever visit something like that? Did you get anything out of it? <laughs> there was a pastor who was called to a new church one time and he went there and, and he spent the first four days just going around throughout the neighborhood and inviting people to church and made a point of visiting all the members. And he would just spend a few minutes with them, introduce himself, say, I'd love to see you in the house of God this Sunday. Well, Sunday came and the building was practically empty. And this was after visiting for four days. And so the pastor prayed about it and he thought about it and he decided to put an ad in the newspaper. And so he ran in the, an ad in the newspaper declaring the church to be dead and that the church would have its formal funeral this Sunday. The next Sunday, a large crowd turned out for the funeral of the church. 
And the pastor had made arrangements with the local undertaker, and he had a casket sitting there in front of the pulpit. And he preached the eulogy of the dead church. And when he got done, he went around to the front and he cleared the flowers off and he opened up the lid of the casket and he reached in and, and made an adjustment of some sort. And, and then he came back to the microphone and he said, Now folks, I've preached the funeral for our church and I expect each one of you to come and pay your last respects. And so the congregation's curiosity was piqued and they all lined up and they came down and they looked in the casket and then they turned around with a sheepish look on their face and walked out of the uh, auditorium. Because there, strategically placed at the right angle in the casket, was a gigantic mirror. That the congregation had a dead church because the congregation had lost its love for the Lord. And we were just going through the motions. You know, church had just become a religious thing. I just go to church because that's the proper thing to do. Rather than gathering with brothers and sisters in Christ out of a love for the Lord and out of a desire to please God and to express a life that is worthy of our upward calling in Christ Jesus. We are to worship the Lord with all of our soul. Our worship is to be passionate. Our prayers are to be fervent. Our devotion is to be intense. I'll tell you what, if we can get excited about a baseball game, we ought to be able to get excited about the things of God. Can I hear a hearty amen? And I get excited about the baseball games. <laughs> In the Christian life, we are not running for a pennant. We are running for the prize of eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. And so if we can get excited about our favorite sports teams, we need to get excited about our commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are two extremes to avoid when we consider worshiping the Lord with all of our soul. The first is making the mistake of having a faith that is based on feelings. The second is having a faith that is devoid of feelings. You see, I think sometimes the mistake that we make is that we're so quick to point out the error of having a faith that is based on feelings that somehow we think that it is justifiable and righteous to have a faith that is devoid of feelings. And nothing could be further from the truth. God has emotions. We serve a God who is not some stoic robot sitting on a cloud. We serve one who is moved by the feelings of our infirmities. We serve the one who stood before the grave of Lazarus and wept. The one who wept over Jerusalem. We serve a God who is moved. The Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, can be grieved, can be quenched. Not some impersonal force, but a God who has emotions as well as intellect. After all, we're created in His image. And so if we can get excited, like I said a moment ago, about the ball game, we should be able to get excited about an empty tomb that Jesus left. Amen. Now, we don't have the extreme of a religion that is based on feelings, nor do we have the opposite extreme of a faith that is devoid of feelings. But to worship the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul is a balanced view of what Christianity is all about. And so I just want to encourage you that if you're afraid to feel because, well, I don't want to have a faith that's based on feelings, let me caution you, you've made the wrong, you've made the opposite error. The balanced biblical view is to be passionate about our faith, to have a love for God that warms our hearts. For all of his mistakes as a parent, King David had one really powerful thing going for him. He was a man after God's own heart. And I'll tell you what, you cannot read through the Psalter without being moved by the passion that this man felt for the things of God. God himself has emotions, and so we should too. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and, Jesus says, with all of your mind. Paul picks up this thought in Romans chapter 12. He says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So loving God with our mind involves jettisoning worldly thinking. I mean, if you want to know how God thinks about something, consider how the world thinks about it and then think the opposite. <laughs> Jettison worldly thinking. Being renewed in your mind. Meditating on the Word of God. These are the things we must do if we are going to worship the Lord our God with all of our mind. Colossians 3.16, Paul says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Sometimes Christians have a difficult time living in victory. And I've found over the years just in my own Christian life as well as in counseling with others that typically if you find a Christian who's having a difficult time living in victory, that's a Christian who is not jettisoning worldly thinking. It's a Christian who's not meditating on the Word of God. It's a Christian who probably has a healthy, uh, an unhealthy appetite for worldly entertainment. And then you talk to me, you say, well, are you in the Word of God? Well, not really. I don't get anything out of it. Well, you know, if I go to Ponderosa after church today and just absolutely pig out and gorge myself, then when I get home, I'm not going to be hungry for lunch. That if my wife has put on, you know, lunch and she's spread a nice table for us and I think, man, I am just so hungry, I can't wait till I get home. And so I go over to the little convenience store here and I eat a bag of Doritos on the way home. I'm not going to want what she made for dinner, right? The point is, sometimes as believers, we have no hunger for the Word of God because we've gorged ourselves on the things of the world. And I'm not saying that all entertainment is bad. I'm not saying that there's not a, a time when it's nice just to kind of disengage and, and just be amused by something that is, you know, good and clean and funny. But we've got to be so careful that we are not satiating our appetite on the things of the world and then wondering why we don't want to drink from the water of life. You know, the old saying is you can't lead a, a horse to water, but you can't make him drink but you can salt their oats. And that's what we need to do. We need to salt the oats of our appetites by not overindulging in the things of the world, but by filling up the inner recesses of our hearts with the things of God. Worshiping the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, soul, and all of our mind. But our body gets involved in it as well. We are to love the Lord, our God, with all of our strength. We're not all as strong as we want to be. We're not all in the shape that we want to be. Andy Rooney used to say, I'm in shape. Round's a shape. <laughs> but we're not all in the physical condition that we would like to be. A friend emailed me a simple pattern of the American male's life. Guys, see if you can relate to this. He said, in the first stage of life, you believe in Santa Claus. Second stage, you don't believe in Santa Claus. Third stage, you become Santa Claus. Fourth stage, you look like Santa Claus. <laughs> Stages of the American male. <laughs> Say, well, that's really funny, but how does that help us to worship the Lord with all of our strength? I don't know, I just thought it was a funny story. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. According to the Bible, we are physical, spiritual, emotional, intellectual beings. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and even strength. And so that includes our physical being. We're to love God with our physical strength. And of course, one of the ways that we do that is by honoring God with our bodies. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so when we look at this, maybe the first thing that we think of is physical conditioning. Maybe the first thing we think of is being healthy, you know, getting good nutrition, getting good sleep at night, and all those kinds of things that are important to good health. But I would suggest that that's just because that's the way our culture considers things. That when, this, uh, when you investigate this scripture and others like it, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that really what Paul is talking about here is sexual purity that we are to live lives of sexual purity because to do otherwise would be to disgrace God 
you know, violating his laws, violating his rules. And so I don't want to go too far down that road today just because we don't have the time for it, quite frankly. But to recognize that in a world that is so confused that at times it's very true that that which is evil they call good and that which is good they call evil. May we stand out from the crowd by holding high the banner of truth, God's word. And then saying, you know what? No matter what anybody else says, I choose to believe that God's word is true and that it is authoritative, that the Bible truly is the Word of God. And therefore, I won't live by the standards of this world. I will live by the standards of God's Word. And that includes even my own physicality, how I use this body that He's given me. Because I am going to worship the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, God has made us wonderfully and fearfully. And when you treat your, your body in a way that is dignified, following the commands of the Lord, it is one of the greatest ways to tell God, I love you, and therefore I will worship you even with my body. So two categories of godly training, the love of God, and then secondly, the love of man. The way you treat other people reflects your relationship with God. I want to say that again. The way that you treat other people reflects your relationship with God. You say, well, how? Well, other people are created in the image of God, right? How can we say that we love God if we don't know how to treat other people? It's really the thought that John had in 1 John 4. He said, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So the way you treat other people reflects your relationship with God. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that. The way you treat your neighbor reflects your relationship with God. <clears throat> and so how are we to treat our neighbor? We are to love our neighbor, right? I mean, after all, it goes back to those first greatest commandments. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what does it mean to love your brother? Micah 6, 8 gives us some help. What does the Lord require of you, and then he answers the question, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Now, we could have probably chosen a half dozen scriptures to speak of loving our neighbor and what it means to exercise brotherly love. But in this passage, we find two moral duties that we each have towards our fellow man. The first is justice, that we are to treat our fellow man with justice. And that means as Christians, we are to work for justice in the courts. We are to look for just dealings in financial affairs. And in all of our relationships, we are to treat people with equity. You probably recall seeing pictures of Lady Justice or maybe the, the uh, statue, Lady Justice. And she stands there holding a, a set of scales. And what has she got on her head? Blindfolds. That justice is blind. And we as Christians should be leading the way when it comes to justice in our culture. To do what is just with impartiality. That we are blind to race. We are blind to religion. We are blind to economic standing. We are blind to political standing. When it comes to this issue of justice. Now that doesn't mean that we compromise the truth. Or that we water down the gospel. Or that we compromise our beliefs. But it simply means that when it comes to issues of justice, we will stand on the, on the side of God and we will stand for justice. And if we see someone who's being treated unfairly or who is being, you know, run down because of their race or, or because maybe they don't have enough economic clout to get the attention of, you know, the best attorneys or whatever, that our opinion will be on the side of God and say, we believe that God has created all people in his image. And therefore, we are going to work towards having a just society as much as it is up to us. So justice is the first moral duty that we have toward man. 
And the second is mercy. To express steadfast and unfailing love and mercy. It is chesed, this Hebrew word that we had last week. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love uh, kindness, which is chesed, and to walk humbly with your God? And we talked about how hesed and covenant are so closely related that sometimes they are used interchangeably as synonyms in the scriptures. And so it's important for us to recognize then that our loving kindness is to be to all people beginning with the household of faith. That's actually what Paul said, Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So what does that look like? Well, in the church, there are many opportunities for us to express this kind of love where you know, someone's having a hard time paying their power bill and so without a lot of fanfare, the church steps in and helps to make up the lack. Helping people to find work when they're looking for work. Helping people to find a new home when they need a new home. Helping people to find furnishings and things of that nature. These are what we want to do. Why? Because it's love and it's expressing mercy. The chesed that God has expressed to us. So may that begin in the household of God and then spread from there, kind of like a rock being thrown into a pond. Well, the means of discipline are training and the second and third we'll take together because they're really two sides of the same coin. Correcting and punishing. Correcting and punishing. They're two sides of the same coin of motivation. In other words, the child's motivation is what determines whether you correct or whether you punish. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, let me give you an illustration. Let's say that the family has sat down to dinner and we're having dinner together and little Johnny reaches for the butter and spills his milk. That calls for correction, right? He didn't mean to do it. It was a legitimate accident. Accidents happen. Calls for correction. So the parents help Johnny to clean up the mess and then maybe they say, now Johnny, that was just an accident and accidents happen. But you know, maybe next time it would be best to ask somebody to pass you the butter. Correction. Now, let's consider the second scenario. In the second scene, the family is eating supper together as a family. And little Johnny has been clowning around since the moment that his little butt hit the chair. He's flying his corn on the cob as a kamikaze into his mashed potatoes. He's stealing food from his neighbor's plates. He's generally goofing off. He's been warned countless times to stop playing with your food and eat your supper. But he takes out his corn for one last flight, bumps over his milk. That calls for punishment. Do you see the difference? The parent probably sends Johnny to his room and says... Well, I guess you weren't hungry, so you can go to bed without dinner. I'm a big one on reality discipline. The punishment should suit the crime, right? And so when little Johnny's playing at the table and goofing off and bumps over his milk because he's not listening to mom and dad, probably the best punishment is, well, go to bed hungry. It's not going to kill him. And probably laying in bed with his stomach growling will teach him a lesson that he'll never forget. And you as a parent will have a whole lot more fun having dinner with him after that. <laughs> but you need to remember a couple of things when administering punishment. First of all, refrain from excessive emotion. Even punishment needs to be redemptive. And so it would be wrong for the parent at that time to grab up the glass of milk and go into a tirade. You are so stupid. What is wrong with you, you little idiot? You should never talk to your kids like that. Ever. And yet you, like I, hear people doing that at the mall all the time. That, that's abuse. Never, never talk to your children that way. And the thing of it is, it undermines your authority. Because authority and respect for authority is built on respect for the person. And even a young child can understand that that's just wrong. 
And so you don't want to fly off the handle at your kids using excessive emotion at a time like that because you're really undercutting your own authority with them. It's better to just pick it. I mean, you may have a disgusted look on your face. I'm not saying that you wouldn't. But just keep it under control. Well, Johnny, I guess you really were hungry because you wanted to play instead of eat. So you know what? You can go to your bedroom and play. But you're not going to get anything else to eat until tomorrow morning. Very matter-of-factly, this is the way it is. And that is the kind of discipline and punishment that will teach your child respect. Also, remember the importance of consistency. Because I can tell you what, after your kid's been in that bedroom for about 15 minutes, they're going to start asking to come out. And I'm hungry. I'm so, I'm dying in here. I'm so hungry. I was really good at this when I was a kid. If you can't tell. But, but if you give in as a parent, that inconsistency will raise a yo-yo. And it'll also put you in a position where your children will learn to manipulate you. And I'll tell you, one of the last things that you want to teach your child is how to become a manipulator. Because people who manipulate others don't really get out of life what God has for them. It stunts their growth as a person. And it sets your parenting up for future failure. So, when you administer discipline, give yourself time to think through what is the punishment that would suit the crime. Because if you fly off the handle and administer something that you could never, ever, ever sustain, you're not going to be able to be consistent. You know, it's like Bill Cosby when he talks about his kids that were pestering each other and, you know, they're picking on each other in the back seat and finally, out of frustration, he says, no one in this family ever touch anyone else in this family ever again. <laughs> Obviously, you can't enforce that, right? Or when you punish your kid by grounding them for three weeks. Oh, man, you just punished the whole family for three weeks, right? <laughs> So you think through it. And sometimes the best thing to do is just send your kid to their room because you need time to think about it. I'm not really sure what I should do in this situation, so go to your room. And then I'm going to think about what I'm going to do. And uh, that little 10 minutes that they wait for you is golden as they sit there thinking about what they did and dreading the fact that you're on, their way, on your way up there to discipline them. And then you hand out a discipline that is suitable to what they did that was wrong. And you'll find that you can be consistent and then you raise children who are consistently respectful of authority. And it not only helps them in their childhood years, it helps them for the rest of their life. That they recognize that there is something called authority that God has established it. And if I will respect authority, it'll go well for me as opposed to if I don't respect it. Crafting your child's character is an important mandate God has given us and one that requires that we would train them, that we would correct them, and when necessary, that we would punish them. But let us always do it with an attitude of love and concern for our children. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we know that none of us are perfect at these things and that all of us can improve and and, and that we all have things to learn. But Father, we recognize that you are the perfect parent. And even as the perfect parent, your kids have rebelled against you. Being banished from the garden. Adam never having sinned, and yet he chose the way of the evil one. And so Father, help us to remember that even when our kids make decisions that are displeasing in your sight, they are their decisions and not ours. Help us not to be too hard on ourselves, Lord, when things don't go the way we'd like to see them go. But help us rather to walk humbly before you, recognizing that you will give us the wisdom that we need to do the job that we need to do as parents. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.